Okay. Um, that may have oversold what I'm going to present to you because I don't have the solution yet, but I have the principles under which a solution should be delivered. So um, uh, don't get too excited. Um, so what I'm going to do is give you a quick introduction to CAVI because no one ever knows who we are, and then the types of biological control I'll be speaking about today. And then I'll talk about what is basically luck. The biocontrol examples I'll give you at the moment that are happening in the field are purely down to luck at the moment, and I'd like to change that into strategy, which is what we're here for. <coughs> and then I'll talk about Japanese knotweed, which I've spent 20 years working on. So, um, and then we'll talk about how perhaps a Zola, which is a, a nice example I'll give you, is the baby step way into biocontrol that's not too scary, because most people are quite concerned by biological control, at least in its classical form. So cavi has been around 100 years, we're not for profit, and we're owned by 48 member countries. Um, and because one of those is China, we've got the biggest, uh, <laughs> very large membership. Um, we work all over the world, obviously. Um, and we have, uh, it's, this slide is a little out of date, we have 450 staff uh, now around the world. <coughs> and I'm based in the UK office um, in Egham, and we have another one in Oxfordshire. And we have a, a site in Switzerland as well, in Delamont in uh, the Jura. So in Europe, re relating just to weeds, so CABI is mainly an international development organization and a publisher. So you'll know CAB abstracts, uh, 12 million uh, environmental and agricultural abstracts available um, through our, our CAB direct platform. But in Europe, some of our work is on weeds. So uh, that's what I, I head up. Um, and we have lots of scientists and equipment and quarantine facilities, most importantly, which you need uh, in order to do what we do. We are leaders in this field, and w we did a recent review. We've got over 800 years of experience in-house, um, and that's rising, unfortunately. We're all getting older. So why do these things become invasive? David's given a quite nice in introduction at the beginning. This is Broom, Cytisus scaparius, in, in New Zealand. Now, Broom does not look like this in Europe, as you well know. This is uh, your garden plant, Broom. Take away the natural enemies, and it has a potential to grow much, much faster and bigger than it does here. That's a simple example. You, it, basically an unfair advantage. Now you can exploit this unfair advantage um, by using an unfair advantage that you may have yourself with the natural enemies you look for. So there are two options for invasive weeds. These are exotic species. These have, in my, my definition of an invasive species, invasive weed, they are exotic organisms brought in because of human intervention, not naturally arriving. <coughs> if it's a native weed though, you do have an option to use uh, a bioherbicide or inundative control. So there are some weeds that you do feel you need to control. Ragwort is an example, Sunixia jacobea in the UK, which has a, the most strong piece of Europe, uh, legislation in Europe against it, even though it's a native plant, because horse-owning people have a lot of influence in the UK. Um, so exotic weeds can also be dealt with by bioherbicides, and I'll give a couple of examples, and then I'll talk exclusively about exotic weed biocontrol with classical biological control. So the inundative approach, it's uh, often used in high-value horticulture because you have to spend a lot of money developing these products that are similar to chemicals. They come in a tin with a label on and a user, a user and, a, and a recommendation. Um, but you also use it where what we call conflicts, conflicts of interest occur. So targeting the species in question with an exotic natural enemy would not be acceptable to the general public because they have some value or perceived value. I tend to describe it as commercial because there's always a label and a product and a sale involved, almost always in this case. So I prefer to distinguish it as commercial and classical, which is for not-for-profit, basically. Here's a couple of invasive species here. Ignore the Tesco trolleys. What we're looking at here is um, uh, Budlia davidi, featuring in some of the nice pictures you saw outside in the hallway there. Um, this is an invasive species from China, and in New Zealand they've released a clear pine weevil against this very successfully. But I would never consider doing this in Europe because this is butterfly bush and everyone loves it. And they believe it has great value for the environment. I don't agree, but. Uh, Rhododendron ponticum is another one. I live in Egham, well, we work in Egham, and the Queen's Garden holds the national collection for rhododendron. So it's very unlikely that I would wish to release a biocontrol agent against rhododendron ponticum because I'm sure a death penalty would be reintroduced <laughs> if I did so. Um, but again, th th this is a rare and endangered species in the Iberian Peninsula where natural enemies may well exist that could help Britain, but probably not a good target to go for. <coughs> Classical biocontrol is very well established. It's been around 100 years too. Um, and it uses natural enemies from the area of origin, often for a single release, one-off release, permanent control. That's the theory. 
Um, and classical biocontrol has been used an awful lot in the field, mostly against insects, but some amazing figures here. I was, I was amazed when I, I actually discovered these figures a few years ago. So there's a lot of biocontrol going on that you don't really know about. And it's based on the enemy release hypothesis. So this is that when an organism is freed from its natural enemies, it's able to invest more and grow faster, much the same as crops without pests grow faster and bigger than with pests. It's the same principle. Um, and the theory, there's a very simple theory. Your pest population is high. After the introduction of your biological control agent, there's a slow moderation of the pest and the biocontrol agent, which is dependent upon that pest and that pest alone, to reach a threshold which no one ever dis describes in advance, but it's supposedly this economic or environmental threshold that we all agreed was going to be achieved after the event. But this is how it's supposed to work. <coughs> Unfortunately, we can use examples that show that quite nicely. This is water hyacinth, a very controversial species in Europe, um, valued in the north, detested in the south, uh, and blamed upon British holiday home owners in Spain, apparently. Uh, and this has been a subject of biocontrol for many, many years, near Catina icornii, uh, very effective biocontrol globally. And here we have the, the true data. These are um, acres on the left, so massive figures in Louisiana. After the introduction of the weevil in 74, you now have this permanent control forever. So this is, this is what biological control can deliver if it's delivered successfully. You have an alternative, and I'm speaking to an audience that is uh, against the idea of pesticide use clearly. And this is the alternative that they used in Spain physically dragging it out. And I would suggest this is not a benign approach. Look at the bank on that river, completely destroyed for the whole length of that river as they hauled it out manually at a cost of 23 million euros. I suspect that that's probably not really a very sensible spend of 23 million euros. And 1.5% uh, of that could have been spent on a biocontrol program looking for a cold-tolerant weevil uh, in the native range in South America. So there are... Your, your assumption that this is a benign approach probably isn't true sometimes. Is classical biocontrol effective? Yes, there was a review recently, a meta-analysis by um, uh, Gary Cluley, <coughs> that showed uh, of all the published material that there's plenty of examples and a high level of success. And economically, it's also a very good thing to do. The, pest, uh, the, the, the range is enormous, from, from you know, virtually zero to, to 4,000 to one. So you can have incredibly successful, what we call off-the-shelf biocontrol, where someone else has spent all the money developing it somewhere else, and you just bring the organism in for almost no cost and control a weed on a whole national scale forever. So uh, you can have a big advantage. The big question we're always asked is safety. <coughs> you're talking about moving an organism from one place to another, which is exactly what happened with the invasive species that you're targeting, the weed in this case. So around the world, there's been over 1,300 releases of more than 400 agents over 100 years. A massive host range testing process is now established uh, under IPPC guidelines. And of all those releases, there's 12 examples where non-target effects have, have occurred. And 11 of those were predicted by the research. The policymakers decided to release anyway because they didn't care so much about the rare native species because a whole ecosystem was being lost, for example. But there was, uh, there's only one where it was a surprise, and that was a failure in the testing. So a very, very high success rate. And we was, normally I'm talking to an, argument, an audience that doesn't understand pesticides that glyphosate is not a target-specific thing. It kills anything it touches. So this is uh, a, a quite a different uh, approach. So you'd think with 100 years of experience, there'd be a lot of activity in Europe using biological control for weeds. Well, there, is, there hasn't been. We've been the source perhaps solving many of the problems that we created in our colonial days spreading weeds around the world, but we've only benefited twice. Well, I say benefited. We've only released twice, and those are the two examples I'll give you now. I should also point out that Europe is certainly not um, new to biological control, classical biocontrol. There's been 176 species of insect released outside the glasshouse in the field in Europe for the control of insects. I find that an amazing figure as well. I, I bet not many people know quite how many people, how many things that have been intentionally released in the field. So we are in the age of serendipity, unfortunately, or, or fortunately. This is a, Pot a Puntia Fecus syndica in Spain, uh, thanks to uh, Vincente del Toro for these slides. And by sheer luck, Dactylopius, one of the most famous biocontrol agents in the world, came in of its own accord and is now controlling um, a Puntia and spreading very rapidly. So this is, this is a great result for Spain. This is free biocontrol that we know will work because it's worked in many other places before. So very nice uh, target. Much more controversially is Ambrosia artemisifolia. This is a major, major weed 
uh, environmental weed, agricultural weed, and causes massive impacts on human health because of uh, allergenic pollen. So this should be number one in, in the targets for biological control in Europe. It took a great deal of time for people to even realize the scale of the invasion. Um, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit at the end about how we choose the list of species to go on the regulation for invasive species. I would propose that Ambrosia would not have gone on that list a, a, a few years ago because the scale of the invasion is so massive, anyone trying to control this would spend billions. So I, I propose that that would not have made it on the list until, by sheer chance, the Ambrosia beetle arrived, Ophrella, <coughs> which is spreading very rapidly, and so fast is its impact on Ambrosia in the region in Ticino, they've actually recorded a decrease in airborne pollen within a year of its arrival. So this is having a massive, massive impact on Ambrosia. It's not the one we would have chosen. There's a whole suite of agents, and this one is not the most specific of them all. But this is biocontrol in action happening in the field, and I think now Ambrosia may well get onto that list, because this thing can just be moved around. So that would be a very big decision for a, a new country to make. But the countries that have already been invaded by the beetle, it's happening anyway. What are you going to do? A retrospective risk analysis, probably. So Japanese knotweed. <coughs> this is a project I've been involved in since I started at CAVI 21 years ago. A collection of sponsors came together to fund the work, working closely with Japanese scientists in the field. Daisuke Kurose did his MSc and PhD and is now a, a, a star scholar in the, the Japanese system. And as always, we discover in the native range, there's many more natural enemies than there are in the exotic range. And this is an important fact that people forget. The exotic species don't really support the network of natural enemies that create the food web on which the rest of the environment survives. The presence of something green does not necessarily mean something positive. Um, of all those species, we discovered 186 species on Japanese knotweed in Japan. And our job is to eliminate, effectively in this case, 185 of those until we end up with something that's specific and safe to release against Japanese knotweed. A wide range of organisms, amazingly, nothing on the roots. A plant with such an enormous root system and all these polyphenols in there, you'd think there'd be some specialists in the roots. The Americans funded us to go and look for root feeders, and we found one happy alid, and that was it, and it wasn't specific. So our job is a process of elimination. We basically use all the information we can find to end up with that tiny green sliver in the top corner which is the agent that's passed the testing process. It means quite a bit of pain along the way. You get to know and love some very nice organisms and then reject them as you go through. Um, all of these agents were found not to be specific enough to be considered for release in Europe. So how do we determine specificity? We bring them back to our laboratory. We dress up in funny outfits into quarantine. <coughs> and it, to cut a long story short, we ended up with Aphalaria itadori. This is a sap-sucking psyllid, uh, a small horopteran. And it's named after its host. Itadori is the Japanese name for Japanese knotweed. So it's a, always a good start when the insect's named after its host. It's very small. The eggs are even smaller. My eyes have given up since I've been working on this. Um, but it's the nymphs that do the job. These are the tiny nymphs that grow on the plant, suck the sap out, and deplete. The, the adults are just egg layers, basically. <coughs> so we use what's called the centrifugal level. Anyway, this is a, uh, using phylogeny, plant phylogeny, to determine specificity. So we start off with the species and then move up to the genus, the subfamily tribes. And eventually, at the moment you get out there, you're starting to reject agents, obviously, because you don't want to be attacking crops. So in the case of knotweed, we use 90 species, uh, or 91 in the end, relevant to Europe. Some economically interesting ones, apple and wheat and barley and things, that aren't really scientifically sensible to test, but we tested them anyway for security. I probably haven't got time to go into the data, but this is just the egg-laying data showing that everything on the left of the red line, these, these, these are eggs that were laid in the testing, everything to the left of the red line are invasive or inconsequentially invasive knotweeds. Everything to the right of the line are, are important, relatively important species, but the left of the line they can develop to adult, right of the line they can't. So basically this is a specialist organism, a very specialist organism, that only feeds on knotweed and loves Japanese knotweed over the others. I've removed all of the other species or what that go out into the, into the warehouse next door. Um, one of the things we did do was transfer nymphs. So not only did we just do the testing on eggs, we looked at whether you can skip that first instar, the really vulnerable, just as they hatch, move them onto a new plant and see if they can survive. How were they able to actually transfer onto that plant? And we revealed exactly the same. Not we can support the organisms. Um, Connoliana is a hybrid between Japanese knotweed and Russian vine. Yet that can also support development quite successfully. 
but everything else crashes out except Moulin-Becchia complexa. This was a great surprise to us because this isn't that closely related according to human phylogeny, but the insect knew better because in, in Australia and New Zealand, this is hybridizing with Japanese knotweed. So the insect knew how closely related these organisms, these plants are, but the humans didn't. So insects often are better taxonomists than we are. So we went through a horrible process of, of licensing because it was the first one in Europe. You can read the slide. It ended up with a big com public consultation. So 60 million people were asked their opinion and we ended up with ministerial approval. So the government decided at ministerial level to release. We had a very stringent monitoring with a contingency plan, the first ever contingency plan used in Europe, in the world actually, take it back. Um, and it involved the use of chemicals. So if, we, if something went wrong, we had to spray it with insecticides, which we were very uncomfortable with. Um, and it meant we couldn't do anything near rivers, clearly. So uh, our, our initial thing was handicapped by our inability to use Japanese knotweed's natural habitat as release sites. So, skip the results. After four years of releases, we found they could overwinter, but they didn't grow in populations. So the populations weren't growing fast enough or big enough for us to conclude they were safe. We didn't have any negative impacts because they weren't enough cilia to have a negative impact. So it was very disappointing. Then we did some field cage results last year, and we revealed that in massive numbers, there were still no negative effects on the receiving environment. This reassured the government that we can move on to a broader phase, actually releasing hopefully closer to rivers and give it a better chance of establishment in the field. The, uh, the uh, Canadians and the US have also petitioned for release and will be doing so soon. And we're also looking back at the Japanese stock to see whether 120 generations in a Japanese summer in a lab has not done them any favors as far as releasing into Europe. So we, we may see whether the Japanese new stock is more healthy than the old uh, institutionalized stock. I'm getting towards the end now. I was going to skip through Himalayan balsam, another star of one of the show, one of the uh, pictures outside. A beautiful plant, clearly, but not if you happen to want to look at the biodiversity of that river bank where you only have Japan, uh, uh, Himalayan balsam. We went back to the native range in the Himalayas and the Indian and Pakistan Himalayas, and we found a rust fungus, Sympatians glandulifera, uh, Camarovi glandulifera. Um, Ascospores hit the stem of the, seed, the seedlings and then sporulate on the plant. So it's an ortaceous rust. All of its life cycle completed on one plant, and it hits it twice, or in fact, probably many times, because the uh, ascospore, uh, the uridinia will keep cycling on the leaves and damaging the plant. So this was approved for release following a plant pest risk analysis and consideration of the Standing Committee on Plant Health in Europe. Um, and we've just started releasing last year, and we found it's overwintered successfully, and it infected local plants next to the release site. So very encouraging start. Rust fungi and weeds are a marriage made in heaven. They're highly, highly, highly specific. And we had to rename this one to show it wasn't the same as Puccinia comorovi, which has actually controlled Impatiens parviflora across large parts of Europe. So this has got a really good potential. Um, so just sit back and watch it happen, hopefully. So on to the baby steps, Azola weevil. This is a biocontrol agent that's been studied in the past by the South Africans, uh, released successfully, um, and has uh, worked across South Africa very, very effectively. What we, we discovered in, in the 1920s, it had arrived accidentally into Europe. Again, another piece of luck. This is the last piece of the serendipity puzzle. Um, and it's also all over Europe. So if you look hard enough, you can find this weevil, if you know what you're looking for. But that said, Azola is still an issue, uh, still an invasive species in Europe. So it's not a very good classical biocontrol agent because it's not climatically matched. Nobody went back and said, I'm going to do a biocontrol agent program for Europe I'm going to find the most cold tolerant weevil I can find. This is just something that's coming in accidentally on horticultural sales as a contaminant. And it's still for sale in large parts of Europe anyway. Um, we were involved in this through the RINCE project, which you can look up. Um, we did some training for European partners in France, Netherlands, and uh, Belgium. Uh, we were interested to find those, the way different countries treat their uh, exotic species and uh, for biological control. So that was an interesting experience for us, seeing how different nations have do what you want, right down to we want a full pest risk analysis on an agent that's already been used and is already present in your environment. So it's a very interesting experience. The important thing that biocontrollers love to have is before and after pictures and the scale. So this is a tiny, tiny pond. Local person contacts us. We sell them some weevils at, at cost price and they release them into the, into the garden and don't believe it's going to work. And then seven weeks later, you start to see the evidence and then it's all gone. And basically, it is completely all gone. So when you go back to the area afterwards, you find dozens of weevils just hanging on to the tiniest fragment of Azolla. 
that is hoping it will grow so they can feed, because they can't feed on anything but Azolla, and there's no native Azolas in, in uh, Europe, and they die. It's a very sad story, but um, <laughs> they've done their job, so that's a good story. Um, and it's very effective. So one thing we don't go on about too much is this sets the bar very high for biological control. This is not normal. That's the, like your graph where it just crashes and never comes back again. It's supposed to uh, regulate itself. And in this case, it's actually parallel evolution. These things have not evolved to have any resistance to each other. They're from two different plants, actually. So it's highly specific, but for Azolla. It will feed on other Azolla species. So this is a weird example. So we wrote a paper in 2006 targeting uh, what we thought to be the best biocontrol targets for Europe for weeds. And our, our selection protocol was about whether it's been targeted before, which saves a lot of money and a lot of time, and whether there are any, any other very closely related species there which might limit the chance of biocontrol agents being found. So there's your wish list of things that are up there. The red ones I think we've probably rejected, although Heraclium still has some potential, but I can't go into that now. Um, the green ones we're working on, the green ones are actually working in the field, and the other light green ones are the ones we're currently working on in Europe, not just us, and other researchers. So there's still a few out there that could still be targeted. If any of your pet species are up there, I'd be happy to talk to you about them. And the other ones that we are currently working on, and this funding interestingly comes from the Water Framework Directive commitment from DEFRA. So this is about keeping water bodies at good ecological status, which cannot be achieved if your water body is completely covered and anoxic because of a floating aquatic weed, for example. So hydrocotyly floating pennywort, we've been working for four years on this in, uh, in Argentina and the UK, um, and we've got a weevil that we're finishing testing on, and Eugorex has been dismissed, I'm afraid. That's a bad slide. It should be Hydrelia. Hydrelia is right in the text. So uh, those are the species we're working on, stem miners. And then Crassula helmsii, one of those things that seems to invade Natura 2000 sites and Ramsar sites. Um, we've got an aerified mite, the one in the middle, tiny, tiny mite, that will probably attack the out-of-water um, crassula, but we think we're probably going to have to reject the fly that deals with the underwater stuff. So we may only have half a solution if it's successful. So, in summary, I believe biological control, classical biological control, has a very long history. It's very sound principles. It is sustainable and cost-effective. It's benign uh, um, and it can be very effective and it has a very good safety record. Unfortunately, it's very specific. So you can only take out one species, which may be replaced by another. So you have to think about your whole receiving environment when you're considering classical biocontrol. It can take a while. Some things take a long time to be established. European gray squirrel, uh, American gray squirrel took six attempts to establish in Britain, apparently. So I have some hope. Um, and it's not eradication. These things, we never use the E word. This thing will only ever be controlled, not eradicated. Um, it's irreversible, though. Once you've got it out there, it doesn't come back. You can't eradicate it itself. So you have to make sure that your research is solid, and there can be some conflicts of interest. And it's no, we, can get, we can tell you what it won't do, what it won't attack, but we're very bad at telling you how well it's going to do. There are some great surprises and some huge disappointments in biocontrol, so that's the nature of the beast. You think it's, a safe, it's probably safe and worth doing. So my conclusion is it's hard to predict, but it's hard to predict efficacy, but it is easy to predict safety. Um, the politically and regulatory environment is moving towards us. First, the sustainable use directive, water framework directive, invasive species regulation. Biological control has to be growing under those scenarios and consumer demand. So I'd like to think that it is on the up. It certainly has to be on the up. It used to have zero, and now it's got two. So uh, that's uh, exponential as far as I'm concerned. Um, and I would say that the invasive species regulation should mean there will be more biological control in Europe in the future for weeds. Thank you to all my sponsors and the partners of RINS. <laughs>